You know, during praise and worship today, one of the things that just began coming up in my spirit is power and strength. At uh, Hear the Watchmen, uh, Russ Dizdar was not able to make it, and so Mike Spaulding and I filled in first time I ever tag team preach with anyone. And part of, of my session, God had me go in Daniel where it was talking about the Antichrist rising in power. And prior to where it talks about, and there will be those who, that, are, that love their God or know their God or passionate about their God and they'll do great exploits. Prior to that section within Daniel, it talks about how he does, the Antichrist does great exploits. And in my own mind, when I look at the exploits in the Hebrew, it makes me think about when uh, Genesis chapter 6, the Nephilim and the, and the men of renown and the great exploits they were due. But what's interesting is when those that know their God begin to raise up, the Antichrist shifts from great exploits to exploits. And there is this, and the same Hebrew word used for do exploits when it refers to the Antichrist is the exact same word for those that follow after God, that are passionate after God, that they will do exploits. And there is, in, in a sense, when you begin reading it in the Hebrew and examining the dynamic of what's going on, there is parity in the conflict. And this morning as we were in praise and worship, the one thing that kept coming to me is there is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that follow after God, that seek after the things of the kingdom of God, that bore through. There is, there is a firmament right now that has been created by the occult, and we can look at all the abortions and everything that have been done worldwide and L.A. Mazzulli and I were talking about at the conference how that, uh, you know, it used to be in praise and worship sessions, people weren't, fall, they, when they, they would fall before God, they, the, old, the old Pentecostals, the Baptists would call it eating carpet, that the presence of God would come in so strong that you'd be laying on your face before a holy God. And that is now a rarity. And it's harder sometimes to answer prayers it's harder sometimes to see healings. I remember when there was a time uh, in, in the charismatic movement that confirmable healings were a dime a dozen. It was so common that unless it was somebody coming up off a deathbed or coming up out of a wheelchair that could no longer walk, it really didn't get people's attention because it was so commonplace. But the, the, one of the things that I have noticed about the occult is that they are quick to adjust while well, Christians get caught in this rut and they're not hearing from heaven and they're not obeying from heaven because, hey, it worked last year, it worked three years ago, maybe we just need to shout a little louder or dance a little harder. The occult constantly readjusts their strategies when they come against the body of Christ. In fact, um, I've been hearing talk from those that kind of keep their pulse on what's going on in the occult from, from those that are balanced within the Hebraic Roots movement. And they've even noticed that now there are spells and incantations that are basically the opposite. A lot of times they will work backwards uh, in the occult, even, even saying the, the spells backwards, to try to counter those that are keeping the commandments. Now, first of all, what that says to me is those of us that are filled with the Spirit of God, that are really serving Messiah, that are keeping the commandments out of a love for God, we're getting to be a problem that they have got to readjust their strategies to try to counter what God is doing. But one of the things that they have not recognized, and this, this kind of comes into this anointing of Messiah, is that if we really hear from heaven, if we're really moving in the anointings of Messiah, that we can readjust our strategies, that we can hear from heaven and this word comes alive to us, and that we can begin praying different prayers and doing things different and, and getting into fasting rhythms that are different to counter what the occult have done in Western society. And I think that's, that's encapsulated in well, there will be those that know their God, that are passionate about their God, Daniel talks about, that they, just, they, they flow in the ebbs and flows of the kingdom, that they, will, that they will change everything at a moment's notice because God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. 
You know, we, there, there is, and I, I've taught on this, look it up on, on YouTube, overcoming the spirit of entropy. You get on fire in one area, then all of hell begins to go against it to try to put out that fire. But it, the, the fire of God, there's a multiplicity to the fire of God. It's not just one flame when you get it going good. There's the flame of judgment, there's the flame of revelation, there's the flame of fellowship, there's the flame of intercession, and there's the flame of the glory and the majesty and the rulership of God. All these works, so if it's not, you know, with you just sitting here with your spiritual big lighter saying, okay, devil, I got this one flame, I'm just going to camp around it, and I'm going to call it church, the devil can blow that out. Or this little light of mine. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. That's why there's seven flames on the menorah. There are seven levels of revelation. There are seven types of revelation by the Holy Spirit. Now I'm, I'm getting off my nose, but this is okay. We need to understand that although the enemy is up to something, God is up to something for those that will hear. And I want to be a part of his plans. I, I need to, and every one of us, God may require us to sacrifice something to change what we're doing, to, to make parts of walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. And that's part of that knowing God, being passionate about God. If I seek first the kingdom over all the trivial things, even to the point of what I eat, what I wear, isn't that what Jesus said? Seek first the kingdom. When I'm seeking first the kingdom, the kingdom becomes a priority. And flowing in Messiah becomes a priority. And kneeling before his throne so that I can serve him becomes the priority. And when it becomes the priority for the enemy, I get awful hard to figure out. Jesus was really hard for the enemy to figure out. He very rarely did the same miracle the same way twice. Sometimes he'd lay hands on them. Sometimes he'd spit and stick the mud in their eyes. And I think that goes all the way back to Genesis 6. The guy must have had something missing in his eyes, in the construction of his eyes. Jesus said, well, you're missing a little clay. Let me go ahead, you know, put it back. The next time he'll have him do something completely different. The next time he'll speak a word. It really throws the enemy off. But why do we get in such a rut? that we think it has to be the same way every time. Then we're not moving in the anointing of wisdom. We're not moving in the anointing of understanding because not only is it in general, it is what God is speaking right now. It is, an, it is, it is, a, it is a kiros moment in the kingdom of God. It is something now God is saying because he sees what the enemy is doing and he says, if you do it this one way, it's really going to mess the enemy up. So go ahead and do it, kid. I'm here behind you. I just like that. So with all that in mind, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 11. We're going to deal with the last two of the anointings. And I want to stress they are available to every single believer. I don't care if you've been saved five minutes or 50 years, it's available. Part of the problem that we have, if we don't know it's available, if it goes against our theology... Let me tell you something, right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology because they couldn't see past their paradigm as they was developing it. And I'm not talking about moving away from biblicity or biblical orthodoxy, but how many know that we have a Baptist rut? And there's 497,000 different Baptist ruts, by the way. And the Charismatics and Pentecostals have the same, and all these have the same. We need to get out of our rut... Because the way that God did things 40 years ago is not necessarily the way he's going to do it now. We have to use wisdom. We have to have that now word, and it will never conflict with this. And I'm not talking about moving in things outside the word. We have a lot of manifestations today that are being done in church, and they're calling it revival. That if they were done in biblical times, they'd be casting demons out of the people, not calling it the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about divine strategies of how to attack the enemy and throw him out of his rhythm. 
right now, the deep state and everything that's going on, they have a rhythm that's building. But let me tell you something, you get, you get a bunch of running horses, it only takes one thing to begin to trip up the rhythm, and they, and they lose momentum, and they can crash. And let me tell you something, it's time for the deep state to crash. It is time for a lot of things to crash, because what the body of Christ is going to do is we're going to begin moving in this sevenfold anointing of Messiah, and it's going to trip them up because they got the rhythm while most of the church was asleep. And that's got to change. Have you found Isaiah chapter 11 yet? And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots. Oh, I want to stop there and just preach for a minute. Can I do that? Go back just a little bit. You see, the apostle Paul was looking at what God was doing among the Gentiles. And he said, you were grafted in. Some say, well, it's, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in a level, in just a level one sense, Israel. But see, all true Israel has always been grafted into the branch. Abraham got grafted into the branch. Because Messiah transcends time and space. It was Messiah that came and talked with Adam in the garden. It was Messiah that went and parted the Red Sea. It was Messiah that whipped up nine plagues to pour on Egypt and give them their comeuppance. And every single one, he destroyed the reputation and the power of all nine of their gods, their major gods. Just one after another, after another, after another. And then as they were parting and parted the Red Sea and went across, he opened up one last can of whoop Pharaoh on him, this, this, just as we're leaving, we're just going to go ahead and wipe, wipe out the, the premier of your army. Jesus did that. Jesus is the one who sent fire at Mount Carmel when Elijah cried out. Jesus is the one who met him in a fiery chariot when he took him on up. It's Jesus from cover to cover. And he's still ruling and reigning in the hearts of his people today. And those that have believed in faith all the way since Abram, Basic in Hebrew. When Abraham walked with God, halach, between Abraham and the walk is the Aleph Tav. <laughs> Jesus is the key to everything. That's why we've got to have this anointing. You've got, you got to understand who you're grafted into. Jesus said, I am the vine. What are y'all? We be the branches. That's the way we say it in the Ozarks. We be the branches. We be not the vine. He grew up in the earth for the things of God. The tree of life is Jesus and all that he's done for us. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. Every one of us, where we came from was sorry. But luckily, we were neatly trimmed off of that branch and we were put into the one that was not of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but we were put into another tree. I used to be a wild olive. Now I'm a cultured olive because I got Messiah cultivating me. You got Messiah cultivating you. Quit being so wild and learn how to flow with the branch. That's just a whole, that's a whole other sermon. I'm going to get to my notes. I promise I am. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him in the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. Underline those two in your Bible. In Hebrew, whenever there is a repetition, it is significant. And one of the things that we're missing right now in the body of Christ is the fear of God. And I'm not talking about crouching down and worrying about every time it thunders. I tell you what, I know the one who is above the thunder and the lightning and the hurricanes and the tornadoes. And he can say, peace be still in the midst of anything. And the sea and the winds obey him. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about reverence and respect for God. If we really had reverence and respect for God, we'd walk differently. We'd talk differently. We conduct our lives differently. Some of the mess that's going on in Christian TV, if they had respect for God, they wouldn't be doing it because they keep... God is not a big box of Play-Doh that you can make him into what image ever you want to. That is called an idol. 
The Word of God is very succinct. God comes on the scene and says, I'm God, I made it all, deal with it. No apologies. We're the clay. Okay? He's the potter. We're the clay. When the clay tries to make something, it ends up with a golem or an idol that becomes our worst enemy. We got to have fear of God. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Now let me tell you something, we're approaching that ever so quickly. There's some comeuppance getting ready to be loosed on planet earth. And whether you're in covenant theology or dispensational theology, and this is something the pre-tribbers have forgotten, is that let's, let's say I was pre, pre-millennial, which I am, but I'm not pre-trib, I'm, I'm a pre-Rathian, okay? But pre-trib, they all preach it like it's going to be rosy, 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 we're gone, then it gets bad. But even with dispensational theology, it goes like this. It gets bad, 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 it gets bad. Bad, and then we're gone, and then it really gets bad because the salt is out of the earth. That's pre millennial, pre tribulation dispensationalism been put in the proper respect. So it's going to get bad. It's not tiptoe to the tulips. Mike Spaulding and I, the, the, the name of the sermon God gave me were Bloomers on the Battlefield. And I went and I found a woman in bloomers from the 19th, you know, from the 19th century with her parasol. And I told him, I said, the only time the bride in this generation puts down the parasol is to go get a ukulele so she can sing tiptoe through the tulips. When in fact she was called to be clad in armor. When Jesus comes back, not only only is he supposed to be a bride without spot and a wrinkle, But he's coming back as a conquering king. And the Hebraic concept that we see even with the Laodicean church of entering into the marriage ketubah, that's the knocking at the door, is, okay, I go to prepare a place for you. When I get back, I'm coming as king. I'm coming as a conquering king. And oh, by the way, you're supposed to be in parity with me when I get back. Wearing the same armor, having the same sword, on the same sheet of music. I really am going to get to my notes. We got a lot of growing up to do in this generation because of what the elite have done, the Luciferian elite. We have lost ground by the miles, by the hundreds of miles. When you look at what some of the great people in the kingdom of God had preached in past generations, Look at Andrew Murray, look at D.L. Moody, look at Spurgeon, look at many of the others. Today, if I would quote Spurgeon, there would be many in the body of Christ think I was quoting heresy. No, you bought into heresy, that's why he sounds strange. Historically, he was known as the prince of preachers. Who are you? Come on. It's time for us to relearn our heritage Not only our Hebraic heritage, Dr. Bill Hammond has a book, and unfortunately it is out of print, called The Eternal Church. How that ever since the beginning of the Reformation, after we came out of the Dark Ages, God has systematically been revealing truth. And and, and so it's always line upon line, precept upon precept. We're supposed to build on top of the previous generations. And one of the things I have a problem with the Hebraic heritage people is God is now revealing the commandments once again, but they're trying to judge and dismiss great men of God that that was not the truth that God was revealing at the time. And those men were absolutely faithful in the revelation knowledge that God gave them. And so they start uh, disrespecting and dismissing people like Lester Summerall, Smith Wigglesworth, John Knox, all the uh, uh, Andrew Murray, Spurge, and all these great men of God that were faithful in their generation, a hundred times more faithful than the current generation is. Because we don't have the next anointing, knowledge. 
The Hebrew word for knowledge here, that they'll have the, 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 the spirit of knowledge shall come on them, darath. Is knowledge, perception, skill, discernment, understanding, and wisdom. Now notice how it, it, that one word, it, it kind of couples together all the previous anointings, that there was an anointing of wisdom, that there was an anointing of understanding. It begins to bring it together in an unprecedented way when you begin to flow in it. You know, so many times people, uh, you know, look at me and Carl Gallup and so many others and, and are just kind of blown away with some of the things that we teach and the depth of it. Although there is a lot of study involved, there is an anointing to connect the dots. There is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. Now, I want you to get this. When it comes to the Word of God, I don't care what your IQ level is. I don't care what your socioeconomic status is. I don't care if you understand a lot of the things many of us deeper go. Because one, one of the things I have found, you can have somebody that may not be doing with Genesis 6 and Genesis 3 and all these different things. And I mean, uh, one lady that I talked with up there, she said, you know, especially during lunch when I was sitting there just talking, she says, you really got out into, into, not only into orbit, you were kind of floating around out there at the edge of the galaxy, but you brought it back in. And some of us tend to do that. But let me tell you something, there are those that may never get into that, but the practicality of spiritual warfare, the practicality of walking in the Word, they have a depth that many of us in orbit may not have. See, it's, it's different levels, but every single one of us, regarding of that level, when I'm in Messiah, I now receive an anointing to learn the Word, to learn how to walk in the kingdom, because the one who wrote this book moved on the inside of me when I made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of my life. And in the compiling of this, as knowledge begins to take hold, and the only way you can get knowledge is you've got to study. What was the thing that the Apostle Paul told Timothy? Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study. Hebraically, the study of the word is the highest form of worship. It's the form of worship that God called Abraham to. Come walk with me, learn my ways. And what blows people's minds is before Moses, Abram was known for a man who walked in the commandments, statutes, and judgments of God. Not only did Abraham walk in them, he taught them to his children before Moses. Why? Because he was walking with the lawgiver. He was walking with the commandment giver. As he walked with God, God began to give Abram an anointing to where he began to learn the ways of God, and it began to wash out Babylon out of here and reestablish the kingdom as he walked with God. You have that anointing. I have that anointing. I'm tired of Christians that do the same thing 5,000 times and never get any results and think it's going to work on the 5,000th and 1th time. Because they heard a testimony from somebody else who gave a testimony that worked 500 years ago. There's an anointing. There is the Apostle John in 1 John said, we have an unction of the Holy Spirit that, that we know. And I, I tell you what, I know when the anointing begins to flow when I've got on the right rabbit trail. Whether it's studying or preaching, I know when God begins to lead me off or show something different or begin to unfold things that I never saw. If the anointing is there and there is a witness of the Holy Spirit because the anointing of Messiah to learn and to connect the dots and begin to pull in wisdom, to begin to pull in understanding is there, I know that I'm on to something. Every single one of us have it to a certain degree. Now, what I have learned about the anointings of Messiah, they're like a muscle. The more you use them, the more you develop strength in those areas. The anointing of knowledge is like all the other anointings all rolled up together and running on a high octane. How many times have I heard Christians say, well, the Holy Spirit will bring me into remembrance of what I need in the hour that I need it to speak, so I don't need to study. He said he would bring it to your 
remembrance. How can he bring it to your remembrance if you've never heard it, never studied it? We've lost the art of meditating on God's Word. We've lost the art of, of studying God's Word and being... And one of the things I have been amazed about my wife is that a lot of times God will just have her say, go to this chapter in Isaiah, go to this chapter in Ezekiel, and, and, and he's, he's trying to reveal something to her. Now, it doesn't always come immediately because she's got to sit and let that anointing begin to flow and she begins to pray over it, begins to dig a little bit and, and to look at the, the full scope of what the Word is saying. Because the deeper things of God don't, do not come easily. It's you you, you got to simmer in it. you gotta, you got to spend the time meditating and praying through it and, and say, okay, now, because her and I can look at the same Scriptures. And there's a general knowledge of the Word of God that's there that we, her and I can agree on. But for me, there may be a section of it God is trying to bring a now word, and he'll, he'll bring out a certain aspect for Mike Lake that may not be for Mary. But when Mary reads it, she'll, the Holy Spirit will cause a whole other section to begin exploding in meaning as she reads it. That's that anointing going into operation. And the knowledge begins to flow because it's the knowledge of the kingdom beginning to flow in and out of us. And we begin developing it. This next one. Not only knowledge, perception. Perception. The perception of our universe is too small. Our perception of the world around us is too small. We have been programmed to dismiss the supernatural. And I'll be straight up because, you know, I look at the secularists. You see, the, those that are secular and that was the very foundation of secularism, from Francis Bacon on, all those men that perpetrated that and perpetrated devoiding the concept of God outside of society, even within sciences, every one of them were an occultist. Every single one of them. They were into the mystery religions. So it's a ruse. It's to dumb down the masses so that if you don't understand that everything first starts spiritually, 